Hello and welcome to the IRU Stroke Education Series. My name is Andrea and I'm an Occupational Therapist on the Intensive Rehabilitation Unit. And today I'll be talking to you about driving. We will discuss how a stroke, brain injury, or a medical change may affect driving. The License Reporting and Ministry of Transportation Guidelines for Ontario, the Driver Assessment and Rehabilitation Service, and Community Mobility. 62,000 Canadians a year suffer the effects of a stroke. And there are more than 400,000 Canadians living with a long-term disability caused by a stroke. And this is projected to almost double within the next 20 years. About 60% of stroke patients are left with some disability. 40% are left with moderate to severe disability that requires more intense rehabilitation. With respect to driving, 30% of stroke survivors with moderate to severe stroke will return to driving, according to a study by Marshall. However, 87% um, of those who do return to driving have not received any formal evaluation. A study done by Pierre and colleagues in 2009 showed that the crash rate for drivers post-stroke was nearly three times the risk of crash compared to a healthy older driver. For this reason, we like to do further investigations while you're here on the rehab unit. Driving is a complex activity and if it's performed by a person who's not fit to drive, it does present significant risk of danger to themselves and to others. It's interesting to think about how brain function will affect driving. It's estimated that a driver makes approximately 20 decisions for every mile driven. And when the brain is injured, it's often less efficient. And while people still may remember how to drive, their brain may not work fast enough to keep up with the traffic and environment around them. Let's think about this scenario. If you're driving down the highway at 90 kilometers an hour and up ahead a traffic light turns yellow, think about what considerations you have to make regarding stopping for the light. You have to think about the distance that you have in front of you, judge that distance with respect to how much time you have to stop. You have to think about the traffic behind you, the weather conditions on the road, the traffic at the intersection, whether there are pedestrians, and there are probably several other things you also have to think about. So with a very simple scenario, you can see how many things we'd have to consider and your brain would have to make a decision on very quickly. Our brain works by taking in the relevant information and ignoring information that is not relevant to our current situation. We then have to interpret this information, make sense of it. So uh, understanding traffic signs, tying the color of the light to its meaning, um, that type of interpretation. Then we have to take that information and make a decision. And then we have to carry it out physically turning on a signal, applying the brake, or turning the wheel. After a stroke, any one of these levels may be affected um, and interfere with your ability to return to driving in the way that you used to do it. Talking about cognition or thinking skills, post-stroke, individuals may become easily frustrated or confused while driving. They may drift across lane markings into other lanes and have difficulty thinking clearly about surrounding traffic. They also may have difficulty with impulse control, memory, judgment, ability to concentrate or concentrate for a long period of time, have delayed response time and impaired problem solving skills. Also, self-awareness is a deficit that can put stroke survivors at great risk. 
If individuals don't recognize their own level of competency, the deficits and the limits that they might have, they may attempt activities beyond their functional and cognitive capabilities, which puts them and, them and others at risk when you're thinking about driving. We'll speak a little about visual changes. Visual changes are very common after a stroke or a brain injury. Um, and there are some that do need to be investigated before you can return to driving. Up to half of individuals do experience some type of visual field loss. This example presented below is, a, is a, an example of a anonymous, anonymous hemianopsia which is a bit of a tongue twister, but it basically refers to loss of part of your visual field. This example shows a total loss of the left visual field. People may experience um, a partial loss or an upper or lower quadrant. It's not necessarily that the whole field will be wiped out. It sort of depends on the nature of the injury and what's been affected in the brain. <clears throat> On the left diagram, you see a picture of a brain. Those are eyes in the front and optic tracks, a green one and a yellow one. And the two circles in the front represent visual fields. So this individual has experienced um, some type of an injury on the right side, the yellow tract, which has affected the left side of both of their eyes, resulting in no left visual field. And like I said, it may not affect the entire field, but um, it is something that we have to look at. Other visual impairments that will affect driving or elicit uh, automatic reporting are um, visual perceptual issues, um, double vision that cannot be corrected, or vision below 20 over 50 once it's corrected. Um, on occasion, people are not aware that they have had visual field loss. Um, so it does have to be tested and looked at. The Ministry of Transportation does have a requirement for peripheral fields. You have to have 120 degrees of continuous horizontal peripheral field. Um, and if you have less than 60 degrees to either side of the vertical meridian, um, you do need to go through what's called the vision waiver program if you're thinking of getting back to driving. This program helps um, you prove to the ministry that you're able to compensate for the loss of your visual field. Often while people are in rehab and have a visual field cut, we will ask that they see their optometrist to get visual field testing done. This is a test that actually measures uh, exactly where the blind spots are and where you're not able to see. So how license reporting works in Ontario is that the Highway Traffic Act states that nurses, uh, nurse practitioners, physicians, optometrists are required to report any patient over the age of 18 who um, may have a medical, functional, or visual condition that may impair their driving ability. It's important to note that uh, this is something that uh, they are liable for. If they fail to report, they um, may have legal consequences. Um, occupational therapists are considered discretionary reporters, which means we do have the ability to report to the Ministry of Transportation if we feel that there is a medical or functional or visual condition that may impair driving, but we're not legally bound to do so. It's also important to know that these reports are made in good faith and, um, require, and um, do not require consent from the individual. Patients can request a copy of the report 
um, the following is a list of conditions that um, are mandatory for reporting. Cognitive impairment, sudden incapacitation, motor or sensory impairments, visual impairments, substance abuse disorders, and psychiatric illness. Here on the IRU, occupational therapists do the cognitive and physical testing uh, near the end of your hospital stay to help physicians decide whether your condition will affect your ability to drive. So we do do standardized and non-standardized tests that look at your ability to process information, your ability to pay attention, um, visual perceptual testing, um, as well as physical assessment, looking at speed, coordination, sensation, and general movement. All of these factors are considered um, when deciding if your license should be reported to the Ministry of Transportation. If your license is reported by a physician to the Ministry of Transportation, um, this is the, the potential outcomes. So the Ministry of Transportation receives a medical condition form from your physician, optometrist, or nurse practitioner. Um, they have a medical review board that reviews the information and will send you a letter requesting the following. They'll either um, ask for additional medical information and often they include forms that they'd like your family physician to fill out so they have more details on your specific condition. Um, they may ask that you do a three-part drive test at the ministry office. They also may ask for a driver assessment, uh, rehabilitation assessment, which is a more formal evaluation and that we'll talk about later. Um, and in all these cases, your license does go under medical review and is suspended for a period of time. It's really important to read the material that you get from the Ministry of Transportation carefully. It does often contain a due date as to when they would like this information returned. If you think that your license has already been reported, um, you can call the medical review section of the MTO at the following phone numbers. And there's also a website where you can read more about the medical review process. You should know if you do not agree with the final decision of the MTO, there is also an appeals process. If the recommendation is that you have a formal driving assessment, there is um, one center located here at HSN called the Driver Assessment Rehabilitation Service. I believe there is also one more rehabilitation service located at the Canadian Back Institute in Sudbury. There's also a, a website that will allow you to look at other cities that have uh, rehabilitation services for driving. During this assessment, there'll be an in-clinic piece, an on-road assessment, and as well as a feedback session. During the in-clinic assessment, you will have uh, your medical history taken, do some cognitive and perceptual testing that, um, that is required for driving. You'll have a basic vision screen, similarly to the one done in the Ministry of Transportation before a drive test. Um, and as well, they will look at your physical strength and range of motion and discuss any adaptations to the vehicle if that's needed. The on-road assessment is a little different than a regular drive test. So this is done with an occupational therapist and a certified driving instructor. The vehicle is provided by the driving instructor, so it's adapted to have a brake on the passenger side. Um, during this assessment, you will require a temporary driving permit. So DARS will request a temporary driving permit for the day of your assessment. 
Um, the occupational therapist and driving instructor will observe your in-car performance, your physical skills, your awareness of safety, your decision making while driving. And if required, you can try some different adapt adaptive controls. During the feedback session, they will make the decision whether they feel you're safe to return to driving and inform the Ministry of Transportation of this. They may recommend that you have some training sessions. Sometimes we develop bad habits and need a few sessions of uh, instruction. Other times that is to learn new adaptive equipment within the vehicle. Or they may determine that they feel you're not safe to be driving anymore and should stop. It's also important to know that these type of assessments are not covered by OHIP. Regular drive tests and the DARS full assessment have to be paid for out of pocket. Um, a driving assessment at the rehabilitation service can cost around $800. So um, it's important that if you do have to do one of these, you want to time it right so that you're ready and you have a good chance of passing. Here's some example of adaptive equipment that they may suggest. So a spinner knob is a handle mounted onto your steering wheel. The ministry does require that you have two hands to drive at 10 and two on the steering wheel. If you can't do this, you do need to use a spinner knob to have full control. There are many different styles um, and it's important to know that any type of adaptation to your vehicle has to be sold and installed by someone approved to do so. The province has identified vendors that are qualified to do this service. Another um, adaptation that can be made is to cross over signals to your stronger side. Again, if you're unable to use both of your hands, it may be helpful to have your signals on the side of your stronger hand. A left foot accelerator is used if you have potentially a right foot amputation or a right foot that is not working well. Here, um, this can be installed and you can drive with your left foot more easily. <laughs> Mirror extensions are another really common and easy adaptation that may help if your vision um, fields are, are reduced. Here are some of the approximate costs for these controls. Hand controls are used when your lower limbs are completely not functioning and you have to operate the gas and the brake using your hands. If after exploring all of the options, it's determined that you do have to stop driving. It is important to prepare for this. It may impact your work and occupation. It, it will cause a loss of independence. It's harder to socialize with your friends, run errands, and you may start to feel isolated or depressed. Driving is considered to be an essential component of independent living for many people. Um, and having it taken away can be an emotional issue and difficult to accept. So accessing community mobility services um, may help ease this transition. In Sudbury, there are um, handy transit services. The Red Cross Seniors Transportation Program is also available. There is public transit that has all been adapted for wheelchair accessibility in Sudbury. There's taxi services as well, private services and friends and family. And sometimes you need to use a combination of these things to meet your community mobility needs. These are some costs to put things into perspective. Keeping a, a van or a car on the road and doing a 10 kilometer daily trip costs between eight and 
public transportation can be a much less expensive option. I'd like to end by saying that driving is a privilege, not a right. The real right is to have safe roads and community mobility.